Hello, Steve White, Trip 89 for Steve Outs 89, Star Trek's Gatekeeper. Now, I just watched Star Trek Discovery Season 4, Episode 10, The Galactic Barrier, not to be confused with The Great Barrier, which is at the centre of the galaxy, which we saw in Star Trek V, sorry, Jesse Gender, but um, this is The Galactic Barrier at the edge of the galaxy. Now, um, unlike the person who wrote this episode, Anne Caffell Saunders, um, Star Trek fans are aware that um, the Enterprise from the original series went into and passed through the Galactic Barrier three times in the original series. The first time in Where No Man Has Gone Before, um, they went into the barrier, they didn't make it through, they got out alive, um, had some problems, um, but they still had that experience, they would have gained some data and some you know, knowledge from going into the barrier. No ship had ever survived the barrier um, at that time, apparently. But um, later in the series, in the episode by any other name, an uh, alien race called the Kelvins enhanced the Starfleet technology of the Enterprise and sent the Enterprise outside the Galactic Barrier and they brought them back. And all of that information, all those computations, all that data would have been recorded by the Enterprise. They would have had the experience of leaving the barrier, being outside of the galaxy and everything. And um, in, um, in Truth is There No Beauty, uh, there was a, I think a scientist who was driven mad by a Medusan who, through his own computations in engineering, sent the Enterprise through the barrier again safely and into another um, realm or something. So, and then they got them back by um, using the Medusan. So they again would have gained information, data, they would have had the computations that he entered. So they would have gained knowledge from this, experience from this. So saying that none of this matters, um, because in the episode they actually state, the Admiral states that no one has ever left the galaxy. And um, so it's just, we know that that's happened. We've seen it. And it also happened in The Next Generation. Picard was um, pulled through the barrier um, in um, by the Traveller and... They went all the way through different dimensions and everything and then were brought back and even though they didn't do it out of their own power, they would have had all the knowledge and the data um, from everything that he did. So all of this would have mattered and um, you would think in the 900 years since the series they would have developed a way through the barrier um, and you would think that um, the shields and so forth would have been strong enough to get them through um, at this point, at least for this emergency. But um, what they do end up doing is they create this new situation they create um, these cells that pass through the barrier and all the all the discovery has to do is get through the barrier far enough to get into one of these cells and then be carried the way through you know without any harm so they just drift through there's a few little complications but they basically drift through using these cells and exit the other side of the barrier um, unharmed um, which is quite anticlimactic um, now that would have worked as its own element in another story, but they've already established the Great Barrier, what it looks like, how it works, it looked nothing like it, acted nothing like it, and they pretended like these, these adventures, these experiences never even happened. So it's very frustrating. If you're a Star Trek fan and you're familiar with this, it's really hard. You're trying to suspend your disbelief and engage in an episode of Discovery and immerse yourself in it, and you just get slapped in the face by these inconsistencies and they stop you from being able to get into it. And the idea that they are writing these episodes just for new fans and they don't care about fans like me who things like this ruin it for um, is really frustrating because they need to take these things into consideration because a bulk of the fans, you know, know this stuff and it does affect you being able to view it. Um, so that was really frustrating. Now, um, before they went through the barrier, they got a message from the Admiral um, because what happened with the DMA was, although it returned and it was the same size, it was a lot stronger, and it was moving through its mining much quicker, and it already moved on. Instead of taking a week, it only taken a couple of days, it already moved on, and it was somehow um, close enough that it was going to destroy Navarre, Titan, and Earth in, in like 72 hours, I think it was. So then it had a few days, and Michael and the President, because the President went along on the mission, and there was a whole power struggle there, with um, Michael basically saying, you can't undermine me, it affects the crew, and them negotiating all that, which was fine to start off with. But eventually, um, Michael wanted to tell the crew about this, um, that Earth being in danger, and uh, the president didn't think it would be good, that she didn't think they'd be able to concentrate. But Michael argued that basically the crew needs to know the truth, needs to be treated with respect, and needs to know that, you know, there's a plan and everything. So the, the president decided, agreed with her, and told the crew, and they went in, like I said, they got through, and on the other side, they um, they sort of realised that there is a hyperfield um, surrounding 
the DMA and there's a planet two light years away from that that they were going to go to to try and make first contact with species 10C. So that we've already seen in the next episode is what they're going to do. They're going to go down to this planet. We'll see where that goes. Um, but so far as the rest of the episode, um, there are a few other little story points. Um, Bryce left um, to go study with a Dr. T Corvettes um, to study communication. So we've lost another member of the crew. Um, Saru tells the Vulcan president he's got feelings for her, thinking he's never going to see her again because they're going on a mission and she wasn't going to be part of the diplomatic corps that was coming from Vulcan to join the first contact mission. But unfortunately, they couldn't make it, so she did. So Saru never would have said that if he had known he was going to see her there, like the next day. So um, Dr. Colbert tries to help him with that, um, and it's kind of not funny to see him sort of go through this, oh my god, you know, what do I do? Um, sort of experience because we like Saru. I like Saru. Um, now Adira has returned and um, um, Stamets was overcompensating a bit by trying to make them feel like they were crucial to the crew and they sort of talked about that. Um, what else happened? Um, I think that's it. There's only one other sort of story. There was sort of two stories for the episode. Um, basically they wanted to humanize Tarka and show his backstory because they've been happy to portray him as a villain pretty much for the last couple of episodes. Um, and even though he was destroying the DMA and everything, it was really just um, really just um, coincidence that he was going to be saving the universe. He wanted to use um, the, the immense power that um, the DMA was using to power um, an inter-trans-dimensional transporter that he had invented because he wanted to go to another dimension, um, another... Um, reality or universe or something um, and we see that backstory now basically he appears to have been raised in the Orion Syndicate and um, he doesn't seem to have had many relations with people no friends and um, he's put into a lab with um, a scientist who has already had one assistant killed by um, the um, Orions and He's basically put there as a plant to find out what this guy's working on, because apparently he's working on something else. Um, but they become quite close, they become friends, they're together for two years. And eventually um, there's a point where um, uh, the guy's name, the other guy's name was Oris, the alien, and he um, was traumatised by the other assistant being killed, and when the alarms go off he has a panic attack. And um, Taka soothes him and it's quite an intimate moment and um, very gentle and they eventually become intimate and they sort of enter a relationship and I mean both these aliens present as men but um, as male but we really don't know what their sexualities are because they're aliens and it's an interesting exploration of intimacy between two beings in that sort of situation. It's not doesn't appear necessarily romantic or sexual but it's very intimate and um, they work on this um, transporter together and eventually, because they need a lot of power for it, and um, um, Oros thinks that the, the power generated by the planet and I think one of the warp engines he thinks he can get access to will be enough to power it. So they try it, it fails, the security shows up, they beat um, Taka and Ores and uh, beat um, Ores severely, and they reveal to him that Taka was there as a plant to spy on him. Um, he says, look, I didn't know you then. He, he apologises and um, Oros forgives him because, like he said, look, I would have done the same thing, I'd do anything to get out of here. Basically, he he created this inter-transdimensional transporter because um, he wanted to escape there and he found a dimension which he believes basically to be his culture's heaven um, and that's what um, Taka wants to get to. Now, he escapes because um, Oros is too injured to leave so he says, look, go, escape without me, I'll, I'll work this out on my own. He's hiding, um, Tiger's hiding for like two weeks in the bush or something, and eventually there's a great um, power surge and everyone leaves the planet, and he goes back to the lab and he sees um, that um, Oros has um, written the symbol on the wall for um, this dimension, heaven, basically, for him, and uh, he finds some power that he's left, and he goes off and builds his own transporter because he wants to essentially return to his lover. And um, that's the way it plays. And um, it does humanise him a bit more and explain why he's so motivated to go to this dimension, which I was having trouble 
understanding because he's never been there. Why does he think this is such a great place? Why does he want to leave here so badly? And why does he think that's going to be so different? Because he doesn't just want to go there, he wants to reunite with, um, with Horus. So it makes a bit more sense. And, um, I mean, I'm sure I've seen a few comments. I, I'm sure a lot of people were bothered by this. They, you know, like looking at this exploration of these characters who essentially um, appear gay and, um, you know, two men in a relationship. I'm not bothered by it. Um, like the other emotional explorations in, in Discovery, you know, I'm not bothered by it. I'm not a toxic male. I'm not emotionally repressed or constipated. Um, I actually think, I actually agree with Discovery that it is important to use and use, utilize human um, emotions and, and that in um, the missions and that. Like, Starfleet is not a military organization and it shouldn't be run like that. And it's okay to actually deal with emotions and, and have them be part of the equation. You just need to balance it out with logic and rationality and everything. But um, and I think Star Trek Discovery swings a bit too far in that direction. But it is something that's valuable. And it's usually only very repressed, toxic men who think that it has no value and it should be repressed. And the only way to deal with people and situations is to look at it totally logically and rationally with no sense of emotions or feelings and that none of that matters. And that's just a feminine thing. So um, I don't have any problems with all, all of the um, exploration of that in the show. And like I said, outside of the consistencies with the barrier, I enjoyed the show. Um, I think that's it. That's, I think I've covered everything that happens in the episode. Um, Michael schools the president um, about how to be a leader. Uh, it's kind of annoying because she had been um, fairly humble and um, human for the last few episodes. She wasn't sort of, you know, super god Michael telling everyone how to be themselves better than they know, you know, all that sort of stuff, which is very um, irritating and hard to make the character sort of likable. Um, they seem to have left that alone and she seemed to have developed it, but now she's right back to being God and telling everyone how to live again. So that wasn't good. But um, her and the president did work together fairly well and um, I don't know, we'll see where it goes. Um, it did feel a little bit like just putting the pieces in place for this episode, but um, Ultimately, like I said, I think the action was well directed, the the tension, the pace, all that kind of worked. I didn't I don't have any problem with the exploration of the emotional side of the characters or anything and valuing um, all of that as part of their journey and their experience and everything. So um, I don't have some of the issues with Star Trek Discovery that other people and people are criticizing it do. I don't hate it for the sake of it. Um, I'm not going to. But um, that's it. Uh, feel free to share, like, comment, subscribe. Let me know what you think. Um, you know, I'm kind of curious to see how all this rolls out and whether Taka really becomes the whole villain of the piece or not. Um, we'll see. Thanks. Bye.